Hello and welcome to Talk with Jayo. This is part two uh, of uh, my conversation with Joy Doreen Bira. Uh, if you haven't watched part one, you know, just find it right here on our channel. Uh, you get an amazing, inspiring story of Joy. And uh, on part one, you know, we left it when uh, it was all about Uganda, but now we're in Kenya, specifically in Nairobi. And I'd like you to take us through the transition, Joy. Like when, how did you transit now from from Uganda to, to Kenya. Into Kenya. Because into Kenya now you you work with you're gonna also tell us that stations you you you've worked with the right. projects that you've been uh, right. in, in, involved uh, involved in. Yeah so what is the transition? Alright so I'm gonna briefly tell you that by the time I left Uganda yeah I was a radio presenter, a TV host yeah. and, news and news anchor. And I had gained some skills as well in strategic communication okay on on a very not so high level but right. somewhere along the way because okay. there's so many opportunities that came my way as i got into the media because uh -huh. i started with tv and then nine months later an opportunity to work on radio uh, presented itself i did an audition with capital of in uganda uh -huh. started doing radio and then along the way started doing jingles or what you call uh, ads um, yeah. in, in today's world. Yeah. And then I did corporate MCing and moderation of events and a little bit of media training with um, politicians and some business people on, mm -hmm. on interviewing skills and things like that. So I, I yeah. really grew, like my career grew at a very young age um, in Uganda. So by the time I was transiting into Kenya, yeah was I think in 2011. I first got an offer to work in Kenya in 2011. Okay. And I think it was somewhere mid 2011. And I, I kind of shelved it because I didn't know, like I felt though, I felt I had gotten to a level where my career was plateauing in Uganda. I needed something that could challenge me, mm -hmm. but I also, I think I was stuck in that mindset of it's not your time. Yeah. Then I got another offer to work in Ghana with TV3. Okay. So I said, Ghana is probably about five hours from here. You're really but, an Afri African girl. You know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, but I said, Ghana is five hours from, you know, five hours flight. And how many times do I have to come home? Yeah. Maybe twice a year. But with Kenya, that's about an hour's flight from, mm -hmm. from, from here. So yeah. I said, you know, Kenya is it. Plus, you know, people from Kenya are just like us, you know, we share a lot in the culture, the way of life, you know, yeah. the languages, I would probably understand most of them. And yeah. yeah, so I said, let me consider Kenya. So the offer came again, I think it was the HR from the Standard Group who contacted me. Yeah. And he said, would you like to work with us because uh, we have an opportunity and I'm, this whole time I'm wondering, so how did they even how get my contact? How yeah. did my name even pop up, you know, on their radar? Yeah. So I think they, they had covered the 2011 elections in Uganda. Mm -hmm. And at the time, I think probably they took some time to browse through the local stations in Uganda. And yeah. um, that's how, you know, there was mm -hmm. a recommendation from some gentleman called Chris Nabanga. Okay. And he runs a media school, I think, in, in Nairobi CBD. Uh -huh. And, he, you know, he's like, so I think I know her because he had done some trainings with some of the TV stations. So I can get in touch with her. I can yeah. give you her contact. So mm -hmm. I think that's how they got my contact. I see. Got in touch with me. Would you like to work in Kenya? I said, yeah, sure. Um, can you send us some reels of your shows and things? So I sent a reel. I think I put it on a what? bus. Are they available on YouTube? <laughs> no, no, they were not. I, don't, oh, I think the only man. thing at the time that was available on YouTube was a promo. 
of the show that we used to do with my co-host. So I just put together some of those shows and some of the election uh, footage and yeah. then I put it on a CD, yeah. put it on a bus and sent it over. Then I think two weeks later, they're like, so when do you think you can come to Nairobi? Mm -hmm. I said, um, I think maybe at the end of the month. So this conversation had been going on for a number of months. So yeah. I think somewhere in November of 2011, that's when I said, okay, fine, we take a flight. And, and see, you know, probably yeah. I'm gonna do an audition or something. So I came, um, I did the camera, you know, testing yeah. and all of that. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, I'm just gonna go back to Uganda and then they're yeah. gonna let me know if I did well. So after that, they just gave me a contract. contract. Yeah. And they're like, um, are you okay with this? I said, um, we can work something out, you know, on, on A, B, C, D. Yeah. But yeah, I think it would be a good idea for me to transition. So I went back to Uganda and I said my goodbyes. Okay. And in Did December, you make up your mind while you are still in, in Canada? Hey, I'm going to take this offer. Or? I think I'd already made up my mind okay. by the time I because took that flight to come good here. Or because uh, no, because I needed a challenge. I needed I something to challenge I me. And All right. I think also from my younger days, I've been the kind of person who independently makes decisions and then just goes after them yeah yeah so i signed a contract i went back i said my goodbyes or i gave notice mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know did the same thing for tv and radio yeah uh, because i was doing them at the same time okay so i resigned i packed my bags sold my car and, 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 and your, took a flight <laughs> how, how, how was this for your fun with your family my family have actually always been the kind who support you when you make a decision. Okay. They're like, okay, is this a good thing? You know, you're going to be all by yourself. How are you going to manage? I said, you know what, um, give it a year. Mm -hmm. If after a year I'm not complaining, <laughs> then I'm good. If after six months I come to you and say, you know what, I want to come back home. Mm. Please just welcome me back home. Yeah. But I think also what helped is that even my employers were so open to me coming over so they mm -hmm. said you know if if anything happens you know your job is still right here ah, so I yes, made the transition I came and I should say Kenya was really open to me very open very receptive mm -hmm. very um, good yeah. and first thing I shared as well even with Katie and I said there are some things that I might not know because difference in infrastructure mm -hmm. difference in the levels of growth in the media industry yeah so I shared those with my supervisors and they said okay fine we can work on that and um, I started working in 2012 mm -hmm. of January so long story short I have been in Kenya since 2012 and life has been good since then. Uh -huh. yeah okay yeah you need to tell me about family now because <laughs> There's no way you, you know, <laughs> yeah, come to Kenya. I'm sure I just didn't come for work only. Uh, I actually um, did come for work only. Yeah, when but, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I came for work and for me it was actually about career, career growth here, career yeah. growth, you know. Uh -huh. um, I thought I would come here and also do radio, but it wasn't possible because of the contractual terms that I had uh, that had binding me, yeah. uh, so I had to do like one employer at a time. Mm -hmm. So, but then I also started growing the other side of me, which was very nascent in Uganda, which was the strategic communication side. Yeah. Um, I took so many trainings as well. I did media trainings too. Mm -hmm. um, and then along the way, I met a gentleman who I thought, I think this, this is a guy that I can spend some time with. Mm -hmm. And so we dated for a while and then we decided to make things official. So yeah, now I have a family and yeah. two sons along the way. Very, yeah. very handsome boys. Thank you. I've not seen them in person, but I've seen <laughs> photos. <laughs> I actually wanted to come with them, but I thought oh. you know, it's going to be a mess around here. Uh, so keep them away. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Nice. <laughs> Good. All the best with the, you know, uh, motherhood, especially during this time. I don't know Thank how you, you. I don't know how you. Uh, I mean, as a mother, yeah. I mean, how you managing, especially during this time, you know. Well, I think in the beginning it was just trying to adjust yeah. or to adapt to the new normal, uh, because now they were doing school online, and then you also have to work while they're doing school. Yeah. That transition maybe took a few months to adjust to, but then I think after that everything just 
Yeah. You, of course, you have to draw a schedule. You have to make sure that by the time they're awake, you either have work done mm-hmm. by the time they're awake. Yeah. So that by the time they are going into class online, yeah. you know, there's something that you've done as well. Mm-hmm. And then when they're done with school, you figure out how your schedule is going to go. Yeah. Sharing responsibilities. So I think it also helps to have a good partner who understands that being a mother is not just the mother's responsibility or being a parent is not just the mother's responsibility but it's a collective uh, a collective thing yeah awesome Mm -hmm. nice so um now you are doing um because i've met you you know doing some amazing mc work Mm -hmm. you know and moderating yeah you know very high profile uh, business conferences um i know you have um is a show you do, Ed Tech Mondays. Ed Tech Monday, yeah. Such a, you know, I was telling my team, man, this style is so brilliant. I watch the interviews, the questions, <laughs> yeah. the, like the technology stuff, it's like, you, you're so brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. I, I take that as a compliment. You are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, and so knowledgeable. I've also watched you do, uh, you know, correspondence work. I did that. You know, I think you do it at home or yeah, I do it at yeah. home mostly. Um, though we're trying to, because the distance from home to the, to the studio or the bureau studio, yeah, it's quite a distance. And at the time when we're doing most of these correspondences, yeah. you know, sometimes you figure that your schedule is not really allowing for you to travel that far just to do yeah. a live correspondence. But yeah. unless I'm in the field, that's yeah. when now I I can go do some stories yeah. and try to make sure that I'm not really doing it all at home. So yeah. trying to do both the field and also, yeah. And I think okay. they also open to the new way of functioning. Yeah. Yeah. And when you talk about the EdTech Monday as well, it's, I think, uh, one of those shows that I think is now opening up and um, it, it's opening up different ways in which um, parents, teachers, and learners as well can mm. look at integrating technology into the education system. Yeah. And I think that those conversations are necessary, especially okay. now where education has been disrupted yeah. uh, by the new normal mm-hmm. way of doing things. And I think for a long time, technology had been disregarded or yeah. sidelined for a while because yeah. people have different levels of adapting to change yeah but change is the most constant thing that That's happens right. in the world yeah so edtech monday i think is that show that tries to engage people mentally yeah, yeah. i like it i like the concept you know i was having a chat with, with a friend of mine and uh i realized lots of universities here in, in kenya you know, like the private universities have yeah. kind of adopted the change, yeah. and they're doing all their stuff uh, virtual. Uh, but most of the public universities kind of have been very slow in, um, you know, doing their classes online and all those things. And I, like, I think we've had like a whole more than a year of COVID. Yeah. And for me, it's like by this time, you know, everyone should have figured out how to do classes online and just do things virtually. I don't know what. Great. Uh, well, I think institutions uh, per se, they also have uh, levels of approval yeah. and levels of adaptation. So if it wasn't part of their mid term plan, uh, short term, long term plans, yeah. everything happens with approvals with institutions, just like it is with the governments and, and so many other organizations and yeah. companies as well. Because yeah. there's a budget that's set aside for it. And making transitions uh, for technology as well require a good a good a good budget. Uh, one for the software and the hardware as well. Yeah. And then the training of the teachers and lecturers um, at all levels. So I think that one of the most important things for universities now to do yeah. is to see how uh, going forward they can allocate funds or even look for grants if, if that's what it's going to take. Look for grants as well uh, yeah. to help them adapt to technology. Because if you look at um, universities abroad, yeah. they even allow for people to do distance learning. And many universities yeah. here do not have that allowance. Um, but then, you know, lecturers record their lectures, and yeah. those doing distance learning are able to access uh, the information That's or right. the classes at yeah. whatever time and then also write their exams at whatever time. So these are things that our universities need to start, you know, adapting to very fast. Yeah. Because what happens if maybe two months from today, universities are closed again, what happens? 
is education as well going to stop? You know, we need to get to that point where we are now open to distance learning, yeah. uh, that no matter where you are, you know, you can still study and you can graduate at whatever level. Yeah, yeah. good stuff, mm -hmm. good stuff. Let's go back to your story. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, I want to go back to when, when you were still at KTN. Yeah. I don't know how long did you work at Standard Group Media and why did you leave? Uh, okay. Yeah. I would, yeah, I would like a bit of that. Right. And also, yeah. um, in 2016, you had a very interesting story. Yeah. You got arrested. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> what What happened? I think for the 2016 part, yeah. you need like an entire show for that whole story. Yeah. No, you, you, but... can, you can summarize it. <laughs> You, know, you can just give me... But let me take you uh, yeah. to where the first question you asked. I yeah, worked sure. at KTN from 2012 all the way to 2017. 2017. Yeah. yeah, and KTN uh, presented so many opportunities for me. I grew career-wise. Um, I went in as, as a news anchor and reporter. But by the time I left, I had, you know, honed my skills in, in different areas. You yeah. know, I was producing my own shows. Mm -hmm. I was hosting uh, independent shows as well. Yeah. Um, everybody at KTN was, was, was really good with me, you know, from the technical department all yeah. the way to my supervisors, uh, my colleagues, everybody was good. So yeah. I left KTN in 2017 of, I think, September, the end of September, or was it of I think the end of September of 2017. Okay. Um, at that time, there was so much that had gone on in my life right. in 2016 mm -hmm. that I felt, you know, ah, I think I need to rest. You, need you know, I need a break. Yeah. 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 Um, and the first incident was what happened to me in Uganda as well mm -hmm. in 2016. Yeah. And I felt like my life was was being threatened uh, on so many fronts after that incident. Mm -hmm. um, and. Later, I think a month later, my, my vehicle was stolen by one of my colleagues who, um, you know, made some very absurd remarks um, mm -hmm. about the whole situation. I guess he was just trying to <laughs> make up for his sins. Yeah. Um, but in that moment, I felt like, you know, I was, I was depressed. I was, I was getting mm -hmm. a certain level of depression because yeah. in Uganda, there are things I had seen that I couldn't unsee because yeah. people had been killed and... It all happened in my face. Yeah. I could not unsee those things. Mm -hmm. And while I needed probably some therapy or some counseling, yeah. I just felt like, you know, my, my I was constantly looking out for myself, you know, like what if, what if, what if, you know? Yeah. And being in that what if phase, I think in twenty seventeen I first took a sabbatical of about mm -hmm. four months because I needed to just be take away a from and relax yeah, and, take a breather yeah. and just see if I could get over what I was going through. Mm -hmm. And before I took that sabbatical, I had an opportunity to do a training um, on a UNDP project uh, on extractives. So I said, you know, I could take a sabbatical and do this training. Mm -hmm. And probably after four months, you know, just being away from that setting of, yeah. of the newsroom, after four months, I could go back. And so I did that. Um, I took a sabbatical did whatever I was doing, then went back after four months, did the first round of elections. Yeah. But after the first round of elections, I felt that, you know, nothing had, had changed for me. I was going back into the same environment where I had been. And I felt like I needed more time. Mm -hmm. I needed more time away from, from the newsroom. Yeah. Um, so I said, you know, let me just take a break for now. And maybe after... Um, I've, I've done this extra six months, I could mm. think about going back into the newsroom. Okay. So this training was done, I had gone back to the newsroom, but then I felt like, you know, uh, it wasn't really yeah. uh, the space I needed to be in. I felt like I needed more time to heal, um, mm. so I took a break. Then I, I said, guess, yeah. after the six months, um, I'll probably reapply and go back into mainstream media. Yeah. So I just took that break. It wasn't really that uh, there was a specific reason for okay. me to leave. Or, right. Yeah, but I also felt that I needed to grow my other strengths because mm -hmm. I realized I had a strength in strategic communication. Yeah. So I said I could take time and grow that side of me. Yeah which is something I've always done. I take up challenges, I take mm. up new opportunities. So mm. I did that and 
Yeah, so I did that I think most of 2017 and 2018. Yeah. And then in December of 2018, Deutsche Welle contacted me to become a, a contributor for the business mm-hmm. after the show. And I said, why not? You yeah. Know? Let me try this out and see how it goes. You, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't like reach out to them and say, "Hey, they contact." No. Yeah. So while I was at like, KTM, yeah. I, I used to do a show yeah. that was a collaboration between KTM and Deutsche Welle oh, called Eco Africa. It was an I, environmental I show. show. Yeah. And I think probably it was from that perspective uh-huh. uh, that they're like, so why don't we contact her? Because going by her profile on LinkedIn, she says she's done business or yeah. she's been doing uh, business journalism. So that's how they got in touch with me. And uh, we did talk about a few things. You, have, you have a lot of God's, God's favor, you know. I do. Because, um, uh, you know, I've, I've been listening to your story. You see, yeah. I didn't know this detail. That, that's the good thing about talking with Jayo. We say everyone yeah. is important. And everyone has a story to tell. Yeah. You know? So, like, throughout your journey, you know, just doors are opening, you know, yeah. opportunities are coming your way. It's people pushing you. It's, you know, uh, KTN calling, Toshevela calling. It's know. interesting that you say that because yeah. I, I actually believe that God, um, He writes, He has, he has our names in the palms of his hands from yeah. from as early as before we were born. Yeah. So I believe that you just need to allow yourself mm-hmm. to let God work in your life. Yeah. And he actually does the most that he can do. Mm-hmm. I could say in in most cases yeah. I've not been the most qualified person mm-hmm. for a job. Yeah. But I have been the person who says okay I've been asked to do this. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna do it. Yeah. So I, I'm not the kind of person who just lets go of opportunities that mm-hmm. present, are presented to me. Yeah. Um, and because I know that God opens the doors for us. Yeah. So He opens the doors for you, knowing fully well mm-hmm. that you're going to do it. That's right. Not that you're going to sit back on yeah. your laurels and say, you know what? Uh, I'll just give it fifty percent of, yeah. of my ability. Mm-hmm. Every opportunity I get, I give it a hundred percent. If it means me doing consultations for something, I'll yeah. go ahead and do it because I believe that nobody is a fountain of knowledge. Mm-hmm. We are all students of knowledge, right. no matter where you are. Yeah. So if, if you need to be good at something, you need to practice it. And that has always been my belief from a very young age. Mm-hmm. And also along the way, I have learned that opportunities come to those who prepare. Yeah. Opportunities don't just come to people yeah. because they don't know what they're doing. Yeah, so you opportunity know. meets yeah preparation. preparation. Opportunity yeah. always meets preparation. Yeah. So it might have been that I did this collaboration with KT, with KTN and Deutsche Welle as a presenter. Yeah. Um, but then there was something bigger that God was preparing for That's me. Right. You know, so always looking at things from a different perspective mm-hmm. is always important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Um. Would you say that experience in 2016 was like your lowest moment in life? It was, actually. I don't think I have ever come close to to death mm. <laughs> like I did in 2016. Yeah. Um, in 2016, that, that whole situation I was in, yeah. I saw my family friends being put at gunpoint because I was being asked to produce information or footage of a situation that <laughs> that I had witnessed, okay. you know, and I could literally see, like, I think one of my uncles was, was put at a gunpoint and they were saying, if you don't produce the footage that we're looking for, we're going to put a bullet through his head and wow. <laughs> And I'm like, wow. you know what, okay, if, if, if this is what it's come to, yeah. I think um, sometimes they say in journalism, no story is worth your life. But yeah. I think for me in that moment, I was just thinking just how so fickle life can be mm-hmm. just because of one situation. Yeah. And I kept asking myself, so what if, what if, you know, mm-hmm. what if he had been shot yeah. just because, you know? And it put me in a, in a thought process of you need to look at life from a different perspective. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't just that, it, it was also what I had witnessed and the stories that had been put out after that. Mm-hmm. And how information can be concealed. Yeah. 
by the powers that be that you sometimes feel that as a journalist yeah. the truth needs to be told but the truth is not being put out there so getting over those scenes that i had witnessed yeah and then this is it i'm going to stand by it no matter yeah. what comes my way yeah i'm going to stand by the truth and the truth and yeah. nothing but the truth yeah awesome. yeah that's that's really good really really nice so as we kind of just start getting to the close of this conversation yeah to know especially to the young upcoming journalists what are some of the life you know and career lessons that you can you can share out of your experiences both in terms of the highs the highs and, and the lows yeah um i i think I think huh, there's so many lessons I can share. Yeah. Um but I would say because my my grooming started at at a pretty young age. It started when I didn't know that it had started. As early as 16. I don't know yeah. what today's 16 year olds um are taught about work or taught about ethics and and stuff like that. Yeah. But I think that people's interests normally start from a very young age not even 16 it starts earlier than that yeah when you see your child at 4 uh, being fascinated by trains yeah. or cars or or fashion whatever it is yeah don't as parents i think that we shouldn't neglect that part because as early as that a child can start to grow an interest in something so it shouldn't be ignored yeah. now from the young people's perspective i think that as early as 15 or 16 they probably have an idea especially today's um, teenagers yeah. Yeah. they're very smart you know they're very exposed to information they have all these uh, gadgets with them yeah. uh, smart devices uh, right in their faces So there's so much that they can do. There's so much that they can learn. And I think that learning never stops. I'm still learning. I yeah. am now 34 years old. I'm still learning. There's there's a lot that I don't know. Yeah. Um there's a lot that I I I can learn. So I I never take anything for granted. If somebody says, "Hey, would you like to be a pilot?" um I'll probably <laughs> yeah. I'll probably think about it and say, "Can I fly a plane yeah. or not?" If I yeah. can't, then I'll, be, I'll just be honest and say, "So can yeah. we start from the basics mm-hmm. before we fly the plane?" Yeah. Um so there's there's so much that needs to be uh, groomed with young people, but I would say um if you can get a mentor by getting a mentor i mean that if you are young probably 16 18 20 yeah and the people you look up to as opposed to when i was growing up mm-hmm. there people i couldn't access i couldn't access christian mompo or richard quest or julie bishuru yeah um but then as i grew up you know i could access these people mm. i think i started talking about how i looked up to julie gishu from as far back as 2011 yeah. even before i moved to kenya uh-huh. and when i moved to kenya i didn't meet julie gishu until when was it last year wow okay but i yeah. followed her career i mm. i you know used to pick inspiration from her work yeah. and when i met her finally it kind of felt like I was starstruck. <laughs> so I, I was now finally getting to meet a person I've always looked up to. Yeah. Uh but there was so much to learn from her along the way all throughout those years. So get a mentor. Yeah. And I would say constantly upgrade your skills. If you are young and you feel that there's so much that you need to learn, there is no limit as mm-hmm. to what you can achieve. Yeah. No matter who you are, if you put your mind to something, mm-hmm. you work hard at it, you um dedicate yourself to it, you can do anything. Yeah. Um I went to school, I studied information technology, yeah. and I was trained on the job for journalism. Mm-hmm. And I would say I haven't done too bad for myself. Um you know, I'm I'm a business journalist or business media personality. I don't yeah. like to say journalist. Yeah. Uh because I haven't done it professionally, but I would say you can do anything the sky is the limit if yeah. you can work hard yeah. you can dedicate yourself you're open to learning mm-hmm. you can do anything good yeah. stuff yeah good stuff really good uh, so in this age of uh, you know you know social media uptake is really really high uh, fake news is also yeah uh, quite a big issue right now is, yeah. you know our folks would, you know just kind of share share stuff uh, without it being verified mm-hmm. uh, why what's like the most important thing you can tell people in regards to uh journalism being important uh, to society 
I mean, journalism will always be important, um, no matter how you look at it. Because everybody today seems to be a news reporter because they have a yeah. device and sharing information on all these platforms has become so easy because sometimes when someone sees information, say, on Jack's uh, Twitter, Twitter handle, yeah. they think Jack has an inform uninformed perspective. Yeah. So it starts with you as the qualified person. Yeah. What kind of information are you sharing yeah, on your right. platforms? Is it information just for clickbait or is it authentic, truthful yeah. information? Mm -hmm. So I think as um, in a world where we're seeing so much disinformation, misinformation, um, yeah. journalism has a big role to play because um, no matter what people see online, yeah. they still go back to that authentic website. They will still go back maybe to NTV or KTN yeah. or Citizen yeah. TV yeah. to see if what they saw online is exactly what um, yeah. they're seeing on TV so that they can put one and two together. Yeah. However, I think the biggest platforms where there's a lot of myths and disinformation happen to be the social media platforms, especially on WhatsApp. I'm sure your mom or your dad, your folks, your relatives yeah. have at some point forwarded you something either about how a certain herb uh, yeah. cures a certain disease yeah. and they want you, know, you to try it out or something or they sent you a picture that is yeah. photoshopped. We call my mom a nutritionist. <laughs> exactly, because, because forwarding is the best thing that these yeah. old folks know how to do. So it's now up to you to say, guys, please, before you, uh, before you even share any kind of information, yeah. Make sure that it's authentic. And you can do that by basically checking the website where the information is coming from. That's right. Sometimes um, the websites have got these crazy, uh, what do you call them, URLs. Uh, and, and when you look at the URL, it should be the first thing. If you see a padlock up there uh, on the website, it's yeah. one of the things that tells you that the website is authentic. Yeah. If it's not, if there's no padlock up there, <laughs> That's how you know that the website yeah. you're checking out is not safe yeah. and could be having fake information. So I think that we as journalists have a role to play in um, making sure that people who are feeding on disinformation mm -hmm. are feeding. being are feeding now on rightful and accurate information. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Good stuff. My last question for you. Yeah. Um, because you have you have achieved a lot. You know, right now you're you're a really professional business. Uh, uh, media personality, your strategic communication specialist. Uh, you call yourself an Afro pop. Afro optimist. Afro, Afro, opti Afro optimist, <laughs> not Afro pop. Sorry. Afro, it's Afro. fine. I can sing too. I can sing some. <laughs> well, can In the bathroom. Much. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. He says he can sing. Actually, what's your favorite music? If you can sing. Ah, I listen to all kinds of music. Okay. Um, but I love I love Kenyan music. I listen to Calligraph Jones uh -huh. music. Do you love hip hop? <laughs> I love hip hop. I don't big, know. I love people saying Calligraph um, uh, Jones. Uh, <laughs> I love So to Soul. Okay. Um, I also listen to Sunai Pei. I think yeah, Sunai Pei is one of the most underrated uh, artists so. in the country. How vocal pro is Exactly. Incredible. And I also listen to Sage. Um, Sage. Yeah, yeah, Sage. He sings. Live, live stuff. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I think, um, and, and many others. Okay. You know, if I say any, any people you might get. I'm in Kenya. Okay, fine. I listen to a lot. <laughs> Let's just say I listen to all kinds of music. Yeah. Um, and Who's I'm your a favorite fan. My favorite. Oh, yeah. Man, they'll catch feelings if I if I even mention no, okay. one just, over the just other. Three, just three. Okay, let me let three of them. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna say Navio is 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 one of my favorite artists. Okay. And uh, Sheba, Sheba as well is one of my favorite artists. Mm -hmm. And the myth, the myth, I don't the myth. Know. Two of those are hip hop artists. So I'm sure now you really you're kind of you kind of get the picture. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, I listen to generally so many of them. So I, okay. I, I'm going to pinpoint. But I love Uganda music. There's also an artist called um, Apas. Okay. Um, great guy as well, okay. friend of mine too, yeah. and so many others. So I love all kinds of music as long nice. as it's. Af I try to give African artists yeah. the credit that they deserve. I buy their music uh -huh. when I can. Yeah, I download it when I can because <laughs> I. <I've laughs> 
I don't pirate it, uh, I buy it. Yeah. Um, because I think that our artists need all the support that they need. Yeah. Because if we are going to take our music global, yeah. it starts with us. So okay. that's that's part of being an Afro-optimist. I see. You believe in your own African content yeah. and you share it with the rest of the world. Good stuff. Yeah. So my last question actually was... That's the third time you're saying that. What legacy? No, that, that was not the last one. <laughs> the last one for me. Okay, <laughs> all right. Is what legacy do you want to leave? Because at some point, you know what, Jorin? Yeah. We're, we're, gonna, we're all going to leave this earth. We're going to die. We're going to, you know, Jesus will come back. Like, what would you want to be remembered for? I know, I know you're still young, you're just 34. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, but, who would you ask about but, legacy no, at 34? No, 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 no. no. You know, there's a way, you know, you kind of, um, yeah. you know, um, there's something you want to go on yeah. and doing and you, know, you want to do that. Like, how would you want What kind of or legacy are you build? I think let's put it that way. Okay, I've only just started building my, lo- my legacy. Let, let me put it that way. Um, but if anything, even now, yeah. when... I talk to people. Yeah. I talk to them because I want for them, after I have left the room, mm-hmm. to feel like I made them feel important. Yeah. Um, to feel like there's something I, of value that I brought into their lives. And to also feel like there's something impactful I left them with. Yeah. And so with everything that I do with my work as a business media personality, as, as a strategic communicator, yeah. As, as an Afro-optimist, as, 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 as a mom. moderator, and as, a mom too. as a speaker and as a mom, yeah. I, I try to make sure that all of these things are coming out. So yeah. I believe in impacting people's lives. Mm-hmm. So I would like to be remembered yeah. as the person who left an impact in, in anybody's wow. life. Uh, because I am passionate about making sure that people, especially girl children, uh, get the education that they need. Um, and so, in one way or another, I try to add my voice uh, to conversations like that, yeah. where there's need for um, a fundraiser or a contribution. Yeah. I try to make sure that I do that because I believe that girl children deserve a good education. Mm-hmm. Because when you educate a girl, she passes it down to the children, yeah. no matter who they are. Yeah. Um, whether they're boy children or they're girl children, she would want to ensure that it continues, like yeah. that process continues. Yeah. And not that I don't support the boy children, <laughs> because I have boy children, yeah. per se. But I want, to look, I want people to always look at it from the perspective of how much a society can change yeah. when girl children are not neglected. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so for me, my legacy is, is just about impacting lives. Awesome. Um, now and when I'm 50 and when I'm 60, whatever age, yeah. you know, when I'm 80 or 90, I want yeah. it to be that I left an impact in people's lives. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. My favorite author, John Maxwell, about leadership, he says every day seek to add value. To yeah, and you have added value to my show today. Thank you. So thank thanks you for making time. <laughs> thanks for adding value to the show and my life today. I yeah. really, really appreciate you making time. Anytime. Yeah, and I wish you all the best in you know all the dreams that you have, uh, all the plans, all the endeavors. You know, uh, may God you know grant you favor because you have it. I do have you know, it actually. Yeah. I I don't deny that. I've yeah. always had it. Probably yeah. always had it since I was a little girl. Yeah. yeah. All the best. Thank and you. All that you do. Thanks for having me, Jack. Yeah. Um, and thanks to these guys who oh, are not being <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, for doing what they have to do as th- well. Thanks for mentioning that because, you know, my intention today was actually to start by <laughs> thanking them. Okay. So let's close by thanking them. All right. A big thank you to uh, Brio on my camera here. A big thank you to my uh, DOP, Mr. Uh-huh. Ashu Kasiwambua. You know, a big thank you to Mr. Raphael and uh, G are uh, here on set as well, thanks to the amazing <laughs> team. Because, you know, yeah. without a team, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't do a good show without, you know, you wouldn't have a clear picture without Ryo or Ashu on the camera. So thanks guys for the amazing, amazing job that you guys uh, do really appreciate it. Uh, that's it for today's episode. Catch us uh, next week for another episode. We'll have a new guest, uh, different set, and we hope that you will be inspired, you'll be encouraged. And uh, yeah, keep the conversation going right here on the talk with J.O. Share it everywhere. Share with your with your friends, your family, 
your dog, anyone, <laughs> you know. Let people know that Talk With The Year is all about inspiring stories. God bless you and see you next time. Adios.